The conventional deadlift is one of the more common exercises performed in any type of training program. However, in recent years, the trap bar deadlift has gained popularity. In this video, we will be comparing the two movements and overviewing the current research that exists. A straight bar is used in the conventional deadlift and the load is placed in front of your body as you execute the movement. A hexagonally shaped bar is used with the trap bar deadlift. You step inside of this and with the handles either side of you, you lift the load. Typically, a trap bar has high handles and if you flip it around, low handles. We'll be discussing the use of both in this video. Another variance with the trap bar deadlift is in the execution. Most generally perform the movement with a somewhat squat style, where their knees are flexed more and their upper body is more upright compared to a conventional deadlift. However, the trap bar deadlift can also be performed similarly to a conventional deadlift, with less knee flexion, more hip flexion and a more horizontal back. In this video, we'll be discussing the first type, the squattier variation, as this is the one used by most people and the one used in all the research we will look at. Moments are forces that turn something. To understand what external moments are, let's look at a biceps curl. Here we have someone holding a biceps curl at midpoint, with their forearm parallel to the floor. The dumbbell is applying a downward force that is trying to extend your elbow. Therefore, we say the dumbbell is exerting an extensor moment. To calculate this extensor moment, we first calculate the force the dumbbell is applying downwards. This is done by multiplying the weight of the dumbbell by gravitational strength. As the dumbbell here weighs 15 kilograms, we multiply this by 9.8 meters per second squared, the gravitational strength, to get 147 newtons of force applied downwards. We then multiply this by something called the moment arm. The moment arm is the perpendicular distance from the line of force to the center of the joint we're looking at, so the elbow in this case. Let's say this is 0.3 meters. So, 147 newtons multiplied by 0.3 meters equals 44.1 newton meters. Therefore, the extensor moment is 44.1 newton meters. To maintain this isometric contraction, your elbow flexors, so your biceps brachii, brachialis, and brachioradialis, are going to have to collectively produce a flexor moment equal to 44.1 newton meters. If you wanted to curl the dumbbell upwards, your elbow flexors would have to produce a flexor moment greater than 44.1 newton meters. Therefore, the extensor moment, which in this case was the external moment, as it is the moment primarily applied by the dumbbell, which of course is external to the body, gives us an idea of how hard the muscles around a joint may work. With both the trap bar deadlift and conventional deadlift, the external moments are a hip flexion moment, knee flexion moment, and a spinal flexion moment. A 2011 paper by Swinton and colleagues compared the peak moments between a trap bar deadlift with low handles and a conventional deadlift. Subjects who were trained powerlifters performed both lifts with loads from 10% to 80% of their conventional deadlift one rep max. Let's take a look at the results when subjects use 80% of their conventional deadlift one rep max on both the exercises. Peak spinal flexor moments were greater for the conventional deadlift. Peak hip flexion moments were also greater for the conventional deadlift. But peak knee flexion moments were greater for the trap bar deadlift. The greater peak knee flexion moment with the trap bar deadlift implies it involves the quadriceps more than the conventional deadlift. The greater peak spinal flexion moment for the conventional deadlift implies that it involves the spinal erectors more than the trap bar deadlift. Similarly, the greater peak hip flexion moment for the conventional deadlift implies that it involves the glutes and hamstrings more than the trap bar deadlift. However, subjects used the same load on both exercises, which was 80% of the conventional deadlift 1 rep max. The study also tested 1 rep maxes on both lifts. Subjects could lift 8.4% more weight on the trap bar deadlift. When comparing 80% of these values, this would still be an 8.4% difference. Given this, if we compared an 80% one rep max trap bar deadlift to an 80% one rep max conventional deadlift, we would need to increase the moment shown earlier for the trap bar deadlift by 8.4%, as remember, weight plays a role in calculating moments. 
Doing this virtually removes the differences in peak spinal flexion moments and peak hip flexion moments. This would suggest that the spinal erectors, glutes and hamstrings are involved similarly in both the trap bar deadlift and conventional deadlift, while the quadriceps would still be involved more in the trap bar deadlift. That said, moments, although being one of the more important factors, isn't the only factor that determines how involved a particular muscle is. There are a few other factors, including passive tension. Passive tension is particularly relevant to the hamstrings, as due to the length tension relationships of each of the hamstring muscles, passive tension is generated when the hamstrings are stretched. In other words, achieving a stretch of the hamstrings during an exercise is likely more favourable for hypertrophy and overall force production. When comparing the typical more upright, greater knee flexion trap bar deadlift to a conventional deadlift, the conventional deadlift would achieve a greater stretch of the hamstrings. Overall meaning that the hamstrings are likely more involved with the conventional deadlift. The vastus muscles of the quadriceps also produce passive tension when stretched. So as well as the greater knee flexion moment with the trap bar deadlift, it also achieves a greater stretch of the quadriceps compared to a conventional deadlift, thus enhancing the quadriceps ability to produce force. To conclude this section, the trap bar deadlift would involve the quadriceps more, while the conventional deadlift would likely involve the hamstrings more. Glute and spinal erector involvement are probably similar between the two. Now, the data from Swinton and colleagues, and all the logic that followed, was about the low handle trap bar deadlift. Would all of these conclusions here apply to the high handle trap bar deadlift? Let's first take a look at the differences in range of motion. Lake and colleagues demonstrated that when using the low handles with the trap bar, the distance the bar travels, so the overall range of motion, is near identical to the conventional deadlift. But when using the high handles with the trap bar, Lockie and colleagues demonstrated that the distance the bar travels is around 22% less compared to the conventional deadlift. From this, we can deduce that the high handle trap bar deadlift involves roughly 22% less range of motion compared to the low handle trap bar deadlift. Would this change any muscle involvement? The less knee flexion, hip flexion, and for some, a slightly more vertical back for the high handle trap bar deadlift versus the low handle trap bar deadlift would decrease the moment arms for each joint. However, slightly heavier loads can also be used with the high handle trap bar deadlift. This would probably result in similar external moments between them. That said, remember earlier we said that the quadriceps can produce passive tension when stretched. With the low handles, the quads would typically be stretched slightly more due to the greater knee flexion. Whether this would be significant enough to induce greater quad hypertrophy when compared to the high handles remains unknown. Overall, I think both would be comparable in muscle involvement but hopefully future research can provide us with more details. Moving on to some practical considerations, the decreased range of motion with the high handles could be advantageous for some. Some individuals, due to their anatomy, may find their thigh bone makes contact with their hips at the bottom position of a conventional deadlift, which of course, is uncomfortable. Others may also find that the only way they can get their hands on the barbell at the start of a conventional deadlift is to round their back, also due to their anatomy. Therefore, for these people, the high handles with the trap bar deadlift will allow them to get in a more comfortable and advantageous position. Another thing I thought I'd mention here is that if you have some injury or pain with your lower back, the trap bar deadlift, low or high handles, is likely more sensible. With the conventional deadlift, as the bar is in front of you, there's more chance of you getting pulled forward and shifting the load to your lower back as you fatigue. But with the trap bar, given the load is either side of you, your lower back is less likely to pick up the slack as you fatigue. If anything, the load may be shifted to the quadriceps. A 2017 study by Lake and colleagues compared the average force, power, velocity, and time spent accelerating during a 90% one rep max low handle trap bar deadlift and a 90% one rep max conventional deadlift in 11 trained men. Average force, power, velocity, and time spent accelerating were all greater for the low handle trap bar deadlift. Although this is acute data, these results do imply that for athletes, the 
trap bar deadlift is probably superior to the conventional deadlift. This would still be the case with the high handle trap bar deadlift. Lockie and colleagues compared a one rep max high handle trap bar deadlift to a conventional deadlift one rep max for average force, power and velocity. The high handle trap bar deadlift was superior in all areas. The trap bar deadlift does typically involve greater knee flexion when compared to a conventional deadlift. But compared to a squat, there is still quite a bit of difference. Swinton and colleagues demonstrated that participants, on average, had around 78 degrees of knee flexion at the start of a high handle trap bar deadlift. Parallel or slightly below parallel squats are generally around 100 to 120 degrees of knee flexion, while deep squats can be around 140 degrees of knee flexion. Moreover, although the quadriceps are worked to a good degree in the trap bar deadlift, the glutes and possibly hamstrings are worked quite a bit more. Returning to the data on moments by Swinton and colleagues, we can see that the hip flexion moment is meaningfully larger than the knee flexion moment. This is contrasting to the squat. Another paper by Swinton and colleagues found that in a roughly 80% of one rep max back squat with 120 degrees of knee flexion, peak hip moments and peak knee moments are more comparable. A different paper by Escamilla and colleagues found that during a medium stance back squat one rep max, highest knee flexion moments were also more comparable to the highest hip flexion moments. Therefore, it's clear to see that the trap bar deadlift is still very much a deadlift.